calling the Agriculture, Rural Development, and Housing Policy Committee to order today. We have a full agenda. I want to remind all testifiers, I think you were probably given some recommendations as far as uh, time limits for presentations, and let's try to uh, try adhere to those if at all possible. Our first, and also it was in the uh, announcement, but I would also mention that if we do not finish the bills on the agenda today, uh, we, they will automatically carry over to Thursday. At this point in time, our first uh, bill up is Senate File 1748. Senator Kiffmeyer, uh, welcome to the committee and may please proceed. Thank you very much, Senator Weber, Mr. Chair. Glad to be with you today. I think this is one of my rare opportunities to come to the Ag Committee. Uh, glad to do that. Uh, so members, I serve as an appointment from this, uh, to the Center for Rural Policy and Development. And I've been on the board now for about a year and a half or so. And I've come to really appreciate the really good work of the center. And during this past year, we were able to hire a new executive director, Ms. Julie Tesh, who is here with me today, who has added tremendous value to the work of the center. We are a research center. So our goal and our purpose is to focus on rural Minnesota, rural Minnesota and its development, to research uh, what might be hindrances to the development and the needs of rural Minnesota, and information that would be helpful to policymakers such as ourselves. Uh, but with that, Mr. Chair, um, I would defer to the testifier uh, to go over um, the center in more detail. Senator, Ms. Tesh, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. All right, thank you so much. For the record, my name is Julie Tesh, and I am the president and CEO of the Center for Rural Policy and Development. I'm going to give you a brief synopsis today of what the center does and how the center helps you as senators make decisions. So the center was actually founded uh, in 1997, so about 20 years ago, and we were founded as more of a think tank and to provide policymakers and rural advocates, concerned citizens, all of those things, get their ideas. Whoa, we're going a little fast. Okay. Um, we have 17 board members. Everything, everyone is appointed by the governor. And we do have three staff members, and we office out of our home offices. I am in rural Waseca County. We have someone in Mankato, and we have someone in New London. And so we're in the heart of rural Minnesota. Um, I like to emphasize that we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit, non-biased research policy organization. So all we do is policy and research, and I think we do it quite well. And I'm just going to go through very quickly here in, in respect to time, but we take complicated and complex issues and present them in ways that give meaning and relevance. So we do focus a little bit on agriculture, obviously, but we focus on those things in rural Minnesota that affect everyone in Minnesota, whether it's health care, child care, transportation. We do studies on all of those things. Um, we don't determine public policy. That's not our role at the center, um, but we inform people like you who make decisions. Um, state of rural, we do have a state of rural that I'll refer to. Um, you can go to our website at ruralmn.org. But you will see here, um, things aren't new. Nothing is new, really. But popul population growth is slowing throughout Minnesota. Um, economic vitality, the gap in earnings between rural and urban continues to grow. But one little thing is that wages for open jobs in greater Minnesota are growing, so that gap is shrinking. And agriculture, we all know that while land values are still at a historical high, average farm income is currently below production. All right, so the Rural Atlas online, like I said, you can go online and take a look at this and um, interaction collection of maps. So for those of you interested in your region, in your county, you can look up all sorts of demographic information. It's free for you to use. I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, important for you to use back in your areas. Um, one of the things, one of the issues that unites rural and urban, I know that we talk about a rural-urban divide, but I like to look at it as we're all citizens of Minnesota and we all have same interests and needs. One of them is we're concerned with an aging population. Another one is on child care and lack of adequate child care, especially in rural areas. And then also some other interests, there are things that separate us, income. The income um, in rural counties tends to lag behind the metro counties. Yes, cost of living is less, but what are those true costs? Um, and then distance and low population density as well. Um, traveling 
pretty much anywhere in, in certain rural places is difficult. I know where I live, it's a good half hour to a grocery store. Um, I grew up that way, but that's what I'm used to. All right, and what we work to communicate is understanding the landscape. So to give people like yourself um, more information on the regions across Minnesota, but also Minnesota as a whole. And so that's just an example of the percentage of the workforce in farming. And you'll see all of these graphs and charts when you go to our website. All right, every year we do a thought leader survey, and I hope that um, all of you will take part in this. We're going to be sending it out to legislators here at the end of March, and that is how we set our legislative agenda, is by ideas that you all have as legislators in your area and what you're seeing in rural Minnesota. And then we put that together, and you respond <coughs> ranking on what you would like us to research. That's how we do our research agenda. So please be looking for that, and we survey over 2,000 people for that. Um, when we're talking about building bridges with, between rural and urban, we talk to rural experts, um, the people that are dealing with issues every day, whether it's at ag or deed or human services. We gather that information, um, we think about it in the best way can, and then we talk to the legislators. We try to have real conversations, we're just not talking heads. Um, my goal is to make things even more real and more applicable to everyone in, across the state, especially yourself. Um, this year's research, just to go over very quickly, um, actually right in front of you should be uh, hot, uh, literal hot off the presses is this is an executive summary actually of our part two of finding work or finding workers. And this is a workforce study we've been working on and this is talking about people recruitment initiatives. And so this is again just an executive summary and the full thing will be out later this week. I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, some, some very interesting information talking about the workforce shortage and then um, why people leave and why people stay and what we might be able to do about that. Other things that we've been working on um, that we've done research on is addiction. We've received a lot of press on the addiction crisis, workforce housing shortage, and then um, enrollment trends in rural Minnesota. And then also, boy, that just keeps on going. Um, we're also working on school funding and cost of living across greater Minnesota. So we keep a very busy um, research agenda. Um, we have two researchers that are constantly busy and um, I think the work that we do is just fantastic and, and we're happy to provide that information to all of you to use. And so again, um, well, working, I'm really, I, I've only been on the job four and a half months. And so my, uh, my whole thing is really building bridges between urban and rural. And you know, we work through to dispel a lot of myths and thinking, but we are all similar as can be seen by the lovely Spoon and Cherry and, and the Fish and Garrison, Minnesota. We are all Minnesotans and we do have separate issues in Minnesota or in rural Minnesota, but they are all together as well. So with that, uh, I thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Tesh. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, um, I, uh, the chair would move Senate File 1748 to be recommended to pass and re referred to the Agriculture, Rural Development, and Housing Finance Committee. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer, Kiffmeyer, do you have any final comments? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members, for the opportunity to present this bill today. I think this is a worthy uh, expenditure of funds. A lot of miles are gained out of a very modest sum of money. Also, as I've gotten to know the center better, I'm like, I discovered it. It's like, oh, wow, look at all this data and all this information, and it's by county, and it's graphed and charts, and uh, just a wealth of information that's there in the general public. You don't have to pay for it. You can make use of it. So it's been a great discovery and a great tool, and I think very valuable to us as legislators. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. And with that, uh, Senator, uh, the chair renews his motion that Senate File 1748 be recommended to pass and re-referred to the Ag, Rural Development, Housing Finance Committee. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion's carried. The bill is hereby passed and re-referred. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Chairman. We will now turn to Senate File 1368. Senator Housley.
Uh, Senator um, Goggin moves Senate File 1368 to be recommended to pass and re referred to the Taxes Committee. Senator Housley, we have Senate File 3 1368 in front of us. Uh, welcome to the committee and please proceed. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, in front of us, we have the Metropolitan Agriculture Preserves Exploration Modification for Park and Trail Purposes. Uh, in my district, we have the uh, Scandia Trail, and I have with me the mayor of Scandia, Christy Majewski, um, who will tell you a little bit about the bill. Welcome, uh, Mayor. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. I'm Christine Majewski, mayor of the city of Scandia. Um, Scandia has a, um, has, has a bicycling destination, outdoor destination, right on the edge of the metropolitan area. We are on the far northeastern corner of Washington County with the St. Croix River at our back. Um, <clears throat> we have been, the, the bicycling that has gone on in Scandia is most of it roadside uh, bicycling, cycling or on road. Uh, we've been working to get the Gateway Trail extended into the city of Scandia for many, many years now and where we could have it then connect uh, from William O'Brien State Park uh, to the his other historic outdoor and recreational sites within Scandia and eventually going north. Uh, we're eventually planned to go north to the Immigrant Trail and then uh, on up actually into Duluth. Uh, in 2016, the final easement from William O'Brien to downtown Scandia uh, was acquired by the DNR. Uh, but the, the land that it, that final easement was uh, part of a farmstead that is in Ag Preserve. And that brings us to the bill that uh, Senator Housley is putting before you today. Neil uh, Saltis, our city administrator, will uh, describe it more. Okay, very good. Uh, welcome Neil to Saltis. the committee. Oh, thank you, Chairman Weber. Uh, Neil Saltis, city of Scandia, the administrator. To put some context to the to the bill, uh, as the mayor uh, mentioned, there's a two there's a two mile segment of the Gateway Trail that extends between William O'Brien State Park and downtown Scandia. Of that, uh, 1.2 miles, or you know, 60 percent of it, the DNR has acquired easement has acquired easements for over a decade, and as the mayor referenced in 2016, uh, they acquired the last piece. They negotiated with Arden Johnson for the eight-tenths of a mile segment that borders the western side of his property. And this completes the acquisition of that segment that would you know, allow for planning. Mr. Johnson has 210 acres in the met that are designated within the Metropolitan Ag Preserve. Uh, this trail easement along the side of his property encompasses a little over seven acres of that property. Uh, in December 2016, Mr. Johnson applied uh, and, you know, initiated the notice for expiration of the Ag Preserve, which starts a, uh, an eight-year deadline. Uh, and that we've got notice from the DNR that really no development of the trail can start before December 2024. What this bill would do specifically is it looks at that eight-year expiration provision. Currently, the only way that that eight-year expiration provision can expire is if the DNR had taken eminent domain action to acquire that easement from Mr. Johnson. And typically, the DNR does not, for trail purposes, does not use eminent domain to acquire those. What this exception, you know, so the DNR, you know, has been negotiating with Mr. Johnson, you know, probably for a decade, and they finally, you know, broke through with Mr. Johnson, and, you know, through fair, you know, open voluntary purchase of the easement uh, was able to acquire it. And what, we, what this bill would then do is allow within properties that are designated Metropolitan Ag Preserve would allow property that is an Ag Preserve that is acquired for trail or park purposes to have the acquiring party seek to get that expired at their timeline. You know, if that was in place right now, uh, we would be, you know, seeking probably further development of the trail, but right now, you know, that is a barrier to development and will will be for the next five or six years. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Administrator uh, uh, Soltis. We appreciate that. Um, are there questions on the part of the committee? 
Uh, just one that I, I have. I assume that when Mr. Johnson filed the notice uh, initiating expiration of the Ag Preserve, it was only for that portion included in the trail. Is that correct? That's correct, Chairman. Okay. And um, and I might ask, and Mr. Knopf, are there are there any uh, other type of penalties that accrue for property having come out early under the original law? Um, Mr. Chair, my understanding is that there, there, there is no way to take the property out. I mean, there's not a penalty because you can't do it. Okay. But if you're in violation of it, yeah, then you're then because the, the property owner does have reduced property taxes um, over the years, and there are penalties related to that. Um, if you if you are doing something in violation, if you if you were to put this in without even checking, but there isn't a way to actually come out early under the under the law, okay. except for condemnation, as mentioned by the witnesses. Um, one other question I might have is, are there, um, by doing so, are we opening up any type of can of worms that might uh, cause, um, you know, a, un, unintended consequences that, that you can think of, Mr. Knopf? Well, Mr. Chair, the, the, um, the bill was narrowly constructed. Um, to only dealing with state agency or governmental units purchasing or obtaining an easement over the property uh, for public trailer parks. So, it, I mean, part of the reason for green for the uh, green acres and the and the uh, metropolitan agricultural preserves was to kind of preserve some open space, and it seems like it's fairly consistent with conserving open space in the metro area. Um, and so, it, I, I think the, the the bill is fairly limited. If it was broader than that, that there there might be some concerns about that. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Any other questions on the part of the committee? Seeing none, uh, Senator Housley, do you have any final comments? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this bill was passed unanimously last year and then ended up unfortunately getting vetoed by the governor. Um, so we're back again this year. It is, I don't know if you've ever been to Senate District 39, but it is the best district in the state. <laughs> and uh, we have some beautiful, beautiful uh, trails. And it does, this little piece um, connects uh, Scandia to the Gateway Trail and then all the way up to Duluth and over into Wisconsin. Um, but it, it, is, it is extremely important and this is a, it's a good bill because it will allow Scandia to get the things done that they want to get done. So thank you, members and Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Housley. And uh, Senator Herr, we may have a challenge uh -oh. coming down here now. Here goes. Yes, uh, I also want to add on thank you, Senator Housley, uh, for reintroducing this bill and continue on, on trying. And also, I, I want to say that Gateway does come through the East High St. Paul. <laughs> yes, Senate sir. District 67 is uh, also a very livable district as well. Beautiful district. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I think we're going to have to sell traveling ads here in the committee. Um, <laughs> with that, is looking forward to be better connected to St. Paul that way. <laughs> with that, uh, Senator Goggin renews his motion that Senate File 1368 be recommended to pass and re-referred to the Taxes Committee. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motions carried. The uh, bill is hereby passed and re-referred. Thank you, Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, we will now turn to Senate File 1995, Senator Ingebretson. Senator Westra moves Senate File 1995 to be recommended to pass and re referred uh, actually to the Judiciary Committee. And um, so, Senator Ingebretson, we have Senate uh, File 1995 in front of us. Please proceed. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. I believe this is my first uh, appearance before this committee. I come to you from the best district in the state of Minnesota, <laughs> one that actually does have the majority of the lakes in the uh, in, in the district uh, in, in uh, the two counties that I represent. But anyhow, uh, Senator Inger, as a Senator Rood might disagree That's with right, you. That's right. Probably so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Senator, uh, excuse me. Senate file 1995 is a. Uh, I'm going to do a little overview, and I do have a, a delete all uh, amendment that I'd like Mr. Knopf to go over if, if uh, the chair would be so kind. Uh, I do have a group of testifiers here. I've also got the University of Minnesota here. Uh, uh, 
Mr. Peter Larson sitting next to me who will, will address the issue. Or have you, if you have any questions with regards to CWD and what we're doing going forward. Um, members, just uh, understand this is something that's come about here in the last little while in, in the state. And, and uh, I don't have to tell you uh, the, the impact this could have, uh, I guess, doing nothing with the impact it would have on, on the uh, whitetail population. Uh, both uh, uh, in the uh, farming community of the whitetail, uh, Server Day farming, as well as the, uh, the uh, recreational part of actually uh, the taking of whitetail, which is a heritage in Minnesota that has been around for many years. And it isn't, members, it, it isn't just the person that buys the license that comes out to hunt deer. Uh, it's the family that comes along. And, and it's been a long tradition in Minnesota and certainly one that I've I've enjoyed in my family and, and many families probably uh, that you know as well. And I, it behooves us to be in these, in, us in these positions to protect that resources as, as, uh, as best we can. And uh, with the most recent uh, uh, findings of CWD, chronic wasting disease in the whitetail herd has become very, very concerning. And I, for one, and I know Senator Rood, has uh, made it one of our priorities this session to deal with this. So you have, uh, you have Survey Day farmers that, that are here to testify. They'll tell you that, you know, the, the, about the business that, uh, that we have. I do have some handouts here. Uh, uh, I will also, if I could just get somebody to hand out two different documents here. I should have done that earlier. You would have had them for your packets. I can describe both of them. Uh, one is from the uh, Board of Animal Health. It'll tell you how many Survey Day we do have actually in, in the state of Minnesota, uh, as well as the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association, uh, a large group, of course, of deer hunters that just had their most recent, uh, most recent uh, convention, uh, if you will, uh, up in Grand Rapids, I believe it was, and they came out with a, a very strong statement uh, on what they think that legislators should do about this issue. Uh, so that, that's basically what you know, speared the piece of legislation that's before you here, and, and I've already been working on it, and, and uh, um, I've already taken some things and moved things around and, and uh, to make it work. As you know, the Board of Animal Health uh, oversees the, uh, the Survey Day Farms, as well as the DNR, of course, over, oversees the uh, whitetail population that are, that are not included in farms. So, um, Mr. Chair, if I could, I, I'd like to offer the A2 amendment and and uh, have uh, staff, uh, Mr. Knopf, go through that. Uh, Very good, uh, uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Uh, the uh, uh, Senator Lane uh, offers, uh, moves the A2 amendment. Um, this would be an author's amendment as this is the first hearing. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Oppose, same sign. Motion's carried. <laughs> amendment is hereby adopted. Um, and then, unless you have further comment at this point, Senator Ingebrigtsen, Mr. Knopf can continue. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, in the amendment, um, as in the bill, the first two sections define commercial herd and non-commercial herd uh, for the purposes of the, uh, of the fee that is paid, the inspection fee. Um, we'll get to that, but uh, the important thing is, is that we're, is we're kind of dividing it between commercial and non-commercial for the purposes of the fee. Um, in section three, um, a couple of things. One is to specify that it's high tensile fencing. You know, the current law has fencing requirements. This would state that it's high tensile fencing. And then the next part of uh, Section 3 deal, deals with um, having two redundant gates, which maintain to prevent escape so that when one gate is open, the other one is closed. Um, and I think we had I don't remember for this committee or Senator Westrom's committee where we, we did have testimony that like 73 percent or 70 some percent of the escapes are through the gates. So what this would do is require the redundant gates um, to stop it. And then also what it does is it says that if a fence deficiency allows entry or exit by Farm to Wild Survey Day, um, the deficiency must be repaired within 48 hours of the discovery. If a deficiency is, is detected during um, an inspection, the facility must be reinspected at least once in the subsequent three months. And, um, and then, uh, Mr. Chair, um, on, in Section 4, um, 
there's also always there's, there's a requirement that each of the farms surveyed be identified. This clarifies that it would should be a distinct number that has not been used during the previous year. Um, it also um, allow it says that it, an animal that is not identified um, as required under the subdivision may be destroyed by the Commissioner of Natural Resources. And then, uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, this is the, section five is the inspection section, um, and in that, um, it's it's going to allow enforcement officers of the DNR, um, as coordinated by the board, to also be involved in the inspection. Right now, it's the commissioner of agriculture or uh, uh, staff from the board of animal health. Um, and then, as you see, for the commercial herds, the current fee is ten dollars per servid uh, um, at, that's basically when they're when at, when they've had their inspection um, uh, on site up to a maximum of a hundred dollars this would take off the maximum fee for commercial herds and then for non-commercial herds it would be a flat fee of one hundred dollars per year um, and then uh, on the bottom of that section, section five, it says the board shall ensure that each farm survey facility is inspected within four months of a previous inspection. The inspection by the agency authorized under this paragraph must include physical of the entire fence. Um, and um, so that's, it's gonna increase the number of inspections. In fact, there's actually a typo on the, on the page before I'll get to, I'll get back to after I go through the bill. Um, Mr. Chair and members, um, Section six, they currently are allowed to have a contested case hearing um, if they've um, any decision regarding the farm survey. What this does is it says that they must file it within 30 days of the revocation notice if it's a revocation of their, of their um, registration. Um, so they can do it for anything, but if it's, a, if it's a revocation, then it must be filed within 30 days. And then Mr. Chair and members, um, in section seven, um, we have the mandatory registration um, for live sur survey or farm survey in the state. And what this, uh, the new paragraph B says that in any 12 month period, um, if they've had two escapes, that the board may revoke, revoke the facility's registration. Um, and then um, it also um, it says that the animals may be seized by the commissioner of natural resources um, if, um, if the board revokes the registration um, unless it would prohibit the, the owner uh, from, um, from receiving federal indemnification, also an enforcement officer uh, from DNR may destroy the survey day 30 days after registration or revocation or after a final decision, a contested case, whichever is later. That's to get at, that's part of the reason for the 30 days is to, is to give a time window for when another action will be taken to make sure those animals are, are um, removed. Um, and then Mr. Yes, Senator Thomasoni. Mr. Chairman, to that point, so is is that for all the deer in the in the facility, or is it just for a facility where a CWD has been found? Um, Mr. Chair, um, this is this right here is is actually when they've had two escape incidents in a 12-month period. We're going to get to where the CWD is found in Section Eight. So Section. Uh, seven has nothing to do with whether or not they've found CWD. It, it could or could not. It just depends, but it's, it's really dealing with the escapes in any 12-month period. And, uh, Mr. Chair, it, it basically has to do with the revocation of their, of their, uh, uh, of their registration. And, Mr. Chair, members in Section 8, uh, we have um, a provision that says, except for a closed terminal facility in which survey day, live survey day are not transported out, the owner of premises where chronic waste and disease is detected, and it has a, a list of things that need to be done. They may need to depopulate the, the survey day, maintain exclusionary fencing on the premises for five years after the date of detection, and, and not stock survey day species on the pre premises after the date of detection. And then uh, paragraph E basically would be uh, when the, the land is sold to a, another party, when they sell it, that they have to um, disclose in writing that the, uh, the requirements uh, for the land so the new owner can comply and know that they're 
know that those restrictions are there so they don't do farm survey um, on the on the same property and section 9 is an appropriation um, to, to the Commissioner of Natural Resources for a grant to University of Minnesota for a test for chronic waste disease that uses samples from living deer. Although, as I pointed out to somebody yesterday, it could be a dead deer. It's basically, it's samples from the deer, but the important thing is this would be living deer. And um, Mr. Chair, um, they're, they're actually, on, on 1.20, it says annual, and that just should be an. an. So I think um, uh, Senator Lane can incorporate in to delete annual and hurt and because we're going to in this bill we're going to inspections beyond annual so annual inspection doesn't really make any sense in that context and if you want to just incorporate that Senator Lang yeah um, <clears throat> with that uh, uh, Senator Lang do you agree to that on the amendment I do agree. okay um, with that that uh, that shall be corrected one question I have. Um, oh, okay. Senator Isaacson, you have a question? Um, regarding the 48 hours of discovery of a fencing deficiency, what happens when you have weather the way we've had it now and something happens and, and what have you? I, I mean, are there, uh, I don't see provisions for a, a, um, a situation of uh, nature that creates perhaps a an impossibility to get out there and, and correct it within that time frame like we've had like we've experienced this year again Senator Ingebrigtsen have you thought about that uh, no um, thank you mr. chair uh, um, I have not actually and of course now we are probably sitting with uh, snow drifts that <laughs> probably reach the top of the fence in different areas uh, so no I have not considered that uh, I'm, I'm guessing maybe the industry could probably address that. They're here uh, as to what they would do uh, if it's happening now. Uh, you know, uh, again, this is a work in progress. Um, um, you know, whether it's torn tornadic in you know, nature or things like that, uh, uh, you know, people are within reason have to, you know, mm -hmm. cover their herd and or whatever they do. So, uh, but no, that not has been part of the discussion. Okay. Um, uh, probably should have thought of that, but uh, I'm not sure exactly how we would how we would remedy that, uh, other than make it we illegal to snow quite so much. Yeah. I, 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 I think so. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, so, so uh, no, the uh, the quick answer is no. I have not okay. considered how to do that. Okay. But Very good. We'll, we'll eight hour period is, is you know, reasonable time. Continue thinking about that and allow the sure. industry some t time to respond as well. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just looking back to the first changes on high tensile or exclusionary fencing, I'm just not sure what the difference is, and I'd like to know. And why we went to just one and not the other. Mr. Knopf? Senator Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, um, Senator Isaacson, it, in the amendment, the uh, exclusionary fencing is taken off. So I know, I'd like, like to know the difference. The, the, well, the, the question, my understanding is these are going to be exclusionary fences. It already says in the law designed to pre prevent escape, and so they're, right. that means that they're excluded. The, have to, so, Mr. Chair, it was just redundant? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator so Isaac, yes. Okay, thank you. So, okay. So, so, uh, did you uh, have a further response? Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, it was going to be that, that the, it's a fence that prohibits deer from traveling back and forth through it, so. Uh, Senator Tomasoni? I was going to say my name's not Mike, but <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, the farm survey are under the board of Man animal health right now. Does the, does the, does anything change in regards to who manages the, the, them on this? And the second question is, um, who determines if it's a commercial herd or a non-commercial herd? <coughs> Mr. Kahn. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Tomasoni, um, yes, everything stays under the Board of Animal Health. Well, the, the board would use the definitions pr provided here to determine whether it is. And basically, if you're, if you're selling um, or offering to sell um, the cervidae um, and, you're, and you're owning them with just the intent to sell, 
Um, it's considered a commercial herd. Non -commercial, we do have a, a several small herds in the state for people that kind of manage them as, as pets or whatever. And so that's where the non-commercial herd to get the, the flat $100 um, fee, it would be one that is managed solely for personal enjoyment and use. And th the board would interpret that and decide whether, which, uh, which, where the herd falls on that, on that uh, line. Senator Isaacson. Thank you. From the, board, is, from the Board of Animal Health, or who's up there right now? No. Sorry, University of Minnesota. Either way. It, and I'm not sure, Mr. Chair, if he's qualified or if somebody else here can answer. Um, what is the, what is the, the relationship between um, uh, these farms and the realities of CWBD? I'm just curious and like, I see that we're taking a strong focus on that. And I want to know what the relationship is, if we're seeing that exclusively happening there, are they the primary causes of this, or is there just a, one of the many reasons we have the problem? Just a quick explanation that would be helpful. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you. Uh, just a couple comments, and then I think we'll have the industry up to talk about that one way or the other, uh, uh, both the Minnesota deer hunters as well as the cervidae industry. But what I'm trying to do by trying to accomplish with this bill, uh, in comparison to what you're going to find in the other body, uh, uh, one might one might say uh, is is a little bit a little bit over the top and unreasonable. What I'm trying to do here is to find a a common ground that 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 farming survey can still exist in Minnesota. Uh, again, if you look at the letter from the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association, you'll notice that it's a very strong stand, uh, and I've kind of picked apart parts of it, and and uh, I think we can still work together and get along uh, in the state. The Board of Animal Health has done, I think, a, a good job. Um, I think you'll find out uh, in talking with the DNR uh, that, that they work very closely together. We've kind of forced that issue over the last couple of years. Um, and uh, so I think there's some finger pointing. I think that's what you're talking about. There has been some finger pointing as to who's wrong here or who's, you know, are the, is it the farming industry that's causing the CWD or is it is it here by, by way of coming across the uh, river from Wisconsin where they have a, a large infection or a large uh, population of uh, CWD animals at, as well as Iowa? I mean, uh, enough of the finger pointing. We just need to get something done here, it seems to me. So if I could have them come forward, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and answer those questions, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Senator Isaacson. Senator Isaacson? Yeah, I think that uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen was anticipating a question I wasn't asking. I really want to know what the statistical relationship is okay. between the two to understand the scope of what this bill does. Thank you. Well, as we have some testifiers come forward, perhaps some of those answers will yeah. come, come forward. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at this particular point, uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen, uh, I assume uh, Dr. Peter Larson is at the uh, testifier's table. Yes, Mr. Chair, and, and you know section, section 9 is an appropriation section. Uh, I, he's here to, to, to deal with that. We've, we've had uh, uh, a couple of different bills uh, uh, floating around. This, this one uh, also includes the 1.804 to the University of Minnesota for research, uh, to set up a research center, and we've uh, discussed this with uh, Mr. Larson and his uh, his team from the University of Minnesota. And if you have any questions, uh, or maybe he could give a few comments if you'd like. Uh, um, he's taking the time. Very good. Uh, welcome, Dr. Larson. And uh, please uh, identify yourself for purposes of the record and proceed. My name is Peter Larson, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. Chair Weber and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'm a new faculty member and I was hired this past summer as part of the Agricultural Research Education Extension and Technology Transfer Program, the AgReet Initiative. I'm a biologist with a diverse research program. I utilize advanced genomic technologies to investigate challenging biological questions and chronic waste and disease represents one of the most challenging diseases that we have ever faced. I strongly believe that in order to confront the emerging threat of CWD in Minnesota and elsewhere, we must be innovative and we must develop novel, cutting edge tools that can be used to fight this disease. I'm here on behalf of a team of scientists from the University of Minnesota who are prepared to assist in the fight against CWD by developing novel diagnostic tools. In addition to myself, our team includes Dr. Pam Skinner, Dr. Davis Selig, who are experts on prion biology and CWD diagnostics, Dr. Jeremy Sheffers, who is an expert on the current CWD diagnostics used 
at the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory, and Dr. Sang Young Oh, who is an expert in nanotechnology and microfluidics. Currently available CWD diagnostic tests are hampering our ability to identify and manage the spread of the disease. These tests are cumbersome, expensive, they require significant technical expertise, and they can take days or weeks to complete. Moreover, confirmatory tests require specific tissues from euthanized deer to identify CWD prions. For all of these reasons, hunters who want to test their deer for CWD must endure a wait time before knowing whether or not their harvest is safe to eat. Those who manage farm deer populations do not have access to a robust test that can be used with live animals. Those who monitor CWD in the wild do not have a rapid and sensitive test capable of providing real-time information from deer carcasses or from the environment. And it is not currently feasible to screen for CWD prions in taxidermy facilities or within facilities that process venison for human consumption. For these reasons, our team firmly believes that the CWD response effort should include a research component that is focused on the development of new diagnostic tests. To this end, we are prepared to leverage our collective strengths to design a rapid and robust diagnostic test for chronic waste disease that will provide a real-time view of the CWD landscape in Minnesota and beyond. The test we envision will have broad utility for detecting CWD prions and could ultimately be used for live deer, hunter-harvested deer, deer carcasses, and for screening environmental samples. Over the past few months, we have identified several avenues of research we believe will make this test a reality. Our test will combine decades of research on prion biology with novel miniaturized diagnostic technology that is being developed at the University of Minnesota. It is a combination of these two elements that will allow us to rapidly detect CWD prions in a variety of samples. The technology we will be used to develop this test as a new diagnostic tool was simply was not available in the recent past. However, this technology is available now and we must take advantage of this unique opportunity. The test that we will develop will help reduce the spread of CWD and will help prevent contaminated venison from entering our food supply. Our immediate goal is to provide stakeholders with a cutting edge tool that will help to monitor and manage chronic waste and disease in Minnesota and throughout North America. Humans have been interacting with deer in North America for centuries, whether it be for food, sport, or simply watching them in the wild. We must do everything we can to protect that heritage. We owe it to the hunter trying to put food on the table to the deer or elk farmer trying to make a living, and to all those who have a connection with deer. Our team recognizes the significance of that heritage, and we are ready to do everything that we can to help in the fight against chronic waste disease. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Larson. And um, I think at this point, we'll continue with testifiers and see what questions may be answered during the course of testimony and then uh, come back for, for additional questions. And uh, then uh, welcome uh, to the table. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Tim Spreck today speaking for the interests of the Minnesota deer farmers. My objective today is to bring some deer farmers before you. If you have any questions about the industry or you uh, don't understand anything, please uh, utilize this opportunity to ask those questions. The, thing that the, the, the message that I want to deliver today is that these are small family farmers. These are people who are struggling. A lot of them ended up in cervid farming because they were having trouble in other areas of livestock, whether it be dairy, cattle, etc. And I think this committee knows more than any other the struggle that our farmers are facing throughout Minnesota. So they get into the cervid industry and all of a sudden they're being isolated and, and in some cases attacked and we believe unfairly. So I'm going to be bringing these folks before you today. We're going to be respectful of the committee's time and try to hold it to two to three minutes each. Um, if you have questions, please ask them. Um, my one comment is that our industry, or I should say our organization, does favor the expenditure for the U of M. We think keeping it in-house in Minnesota is a fantastic way to pursue this. They have the expertise and the skill level and the, the people on staff that I think can really develop this portable, live or dead test for CWD. And it doesn't just only benefit the deer farmers in the cervid industry, it benefits the hunters who can actually have this with them out in the field and have the ability to test. So we support this fully. 
And with your indulgence, Mr. Chair, I'd like to bring my first uh, deer farmer before you. Please, uh, please approach the testifier's table. And again, uh, uh, please identify yourselves uh, for purposes of the record. And uh, you may proceed when uh, you are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to speak today. My name is Steve Yucatel. I'm with Crow River Whitetails in Spicer, Minnesota area. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to speak today also. My name is Melissa Yucatel, and I'm with Crow River Whitetails also. We are a small family farm in west central Minnesota, and under subsection 7, inspections, lines 2.9 through 2.13, that one would cause enormous hardships on my farm. Currently, the fee is $100 annually. And under your new policy, it would increase it up to as much as $3,000 for my, my farm. Um, I've been a turkey farmer. Excuse me, excuse me. I'm just going to reference uh, this would be on the A2 amendment. Uh, this would be uh, Section 5, Subdivision 7, where we talk about the fees. Correct. Thank you. Please proceed. So I've been a turkey farmer for over 20 years, and we went through the outbreak of the bird flu, and which also is a pathogen carried by wild birds, and it was handled well by the Board of Animal Health and USDA. Yep. And that's it. So, so we're asking you to kind of um, maybe reconsider a little bit on the $10 per head fee. Um, it's, it can be a lot for some of the smaller farmers like us, so. Uh, thank you. Are, are the, since they'll be leaving the test fires table, is there any specific questions uh, at this point? If not, thank you for coming today. And Senator Ingebrigtsen, have, has there been some discussion regarding that fee and potential caps and that type of thing? There, thank you, Mr. Chair. There has been, and uh, we understand this is uh, quite a change. I mean, it, it's quite uh, um, uh, quite a lot of a change and, and, and one would say well you know we don't do this with the with the uh, turkeys we don't do it with the the, the, the cattle industry uh, but we uh, I didn't know and I guess I don't know if the wild turkeys were actually affected by the flu I don't believe they were however we do have a whitetail population where we don't have you know wild cows we don't have you know wild hogs for instance so it is different and, and it you know to approach this it, it it uh, it's not you know it's not easy to do this kind of thing, but nevertheless, if you want to, if you want inspections, it, it does cost money, and and uh, um, we know that it's going to be certainly different than than a hundred dollars. Uh, if if you just so you understand that it it it, it caps at a hundred dollars if you have if you have 150 whitetails, it's uh, it's only ten dollars a piece if you only have uh, or or elk or whatever cervidae. Uh, it's only ten dollars a piece, up to a hundred, and not and capped at that. So we feel that that's you know a little bit too low uh, for paying for these types of things. But it's it's up for discussion. Yes, uh, we have talked about putting a cap on it. Uh, there's been just a small discussion about that. Uh, uh, Senator Isaacson, did I read this wrong? It looks like they get rid of the cap on line 2.11, so there yes. is no cap no, for the commercial herds. That would be correct, Senator Isaacson. Oh, correct. but not the private ones. That's the right. non-commercial would still be at a cap Thank at 100. You. Thank you. Or would be 100 flat. That's right. That's right. Okay. Very, uh, yes, uh, Senator Thomas. I don't know if this is for Senator Ingebrigtsen or for Mr. Knopf, but um, so the, the fee would supposedly pay for the inspection. Uh, does that mean that the enforcement officer that we're talking about here would be a new hire? Or is that somebody that is already employed by us? Because if it's somebody that's already employed by us, we probably don't need a fee to pay for their inspections. Sandra Ingebrigtsen. Mr. Chair, thank you, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, the um, the um, Board of Animal Health, of course, does their own inspections as well as the DNR can actually, I believe, uh, go around the perimeter now. They're required to do that, uh, however, only once a year. Uh, I may stay correct, corrected on that, but I think that's pretty much the policy. Uh, and most of that can be done from the road. It can be done visually to make sure that, you know, a, a tree hasn't fallen down or, or whatever. We just wanted to uh, make, make sure that those inspections are actually more frequent uh, because of the, you know, the uh, finding of, of uh, the infected animals. And again, we're, we're trying to do this without pointing the finger at anybody, but nevertheless, uh, 
Uh, we think of having it in inspection more so than more than just one one a year actually to have it done quarterly or, or three times a year again a, a work in progress we started out even more more stringent than that uh, but we do have to be we have to be reasonable and uh, um, I think you know there are some some great the, the talking the kind of conversations that I've had with survey day farmers have been been I think very very good uh, I think like in any any industry you have you have people that really take care of their their uh, their business and there are some that don't and uh, those are the ones I you know I mean that's let's face it those are the ones if there's a bad player out there that's the one we want to you know make sure we deal with and and uh, obviously it doesn't happen too often you can see by the report of the of the uh, Board of Animal Health I think they've run a they've run a pretty good ship over there they've had some good inspections, and, and uh, it, it'll tell you the, the amount of releases, and it doesn't seem to be too big, too bad, actually. So, uh, so no, we're not going to be hiring anybody else, no. Okay. It, it would just provide some funding for additional uh, inspections. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, Mr. Spreck, maybe, uh, or, or the testifiers, but what what do the private deer farmers do with their deer or wouldn't I'm trying to figure out who would not be commercial um, is there is there private farmers that just raise them as pets or as kind of like kittens and they just give them away to somebody that wants a nice deer um, and, and for the commercial, is it is it mostly hunt? Is there some that raise them for food, like like beef cattle, and they sell sell quarters of deer to their neighbors or or somebody in the area that wants deer meat? Um, if you can answer those two questions. Thank you for the question, Senator. Um, th there are a lot of hobbyist people out there that do have a couple of deer. Um, just uh, they can be very tame. People fall in love with them. Uh, you can pet them. They follow you around. They're family to a lot of people. And so there are people that have three or four deer or just a couple. Um, sometimes a taxidermist might like to have a, a deer or two um, to get a, a really good idea of how a mount should look or how, how uh, an up-close look at deer. Um, so there's, there are small hobbyists out there. Um, and there's, there's people that do have five or six deer and with the intent to sell uh, for stocker bucks. Um, most of the larger deer farms, like us, um, we sell some deer, deer urine products. We sell uh, breeder stock does. We sell uh, fawns to other breeders. Sometimes we sell uh, some for pets, uh, bottle feds. Again, people really like to get up and close and, and touch. Uh, our place, we, we do farm tours. Uh, we've had handicapped groups out uh, to visit our place. Um, school tours, uh, sometimes local schools bring uh, bus loads of kids for uh, wildlife classes and stuff, and so we, we give them in-depth education at our farm. Um, we also have a hunting preserve at our place, a large fenced-in area. Um, so we do sell harvest bucks that way. Um, we've sold those for meat um, and, uh, and just livestock, breed stock. Um, as, as many different ways as we can diversify to, to make a living is, is what we do. So, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And maybe this goes into our, our longer discussion. Just, I guess, the, I, I have a question about the why should the general fund, um, when we look at the board um, doing the work the board is doing, and, and just because of, I, I guess I question that, you know, there were $600,000 on inspections last year and there was only $30,000 in revenue, um, you know, from the farms that we're talking about. I, I don't know if, if that's more of a question for us to, to go into uh, as to, you know, why the general fund is, 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 is taking uh, part on this on and for all the work the board is doing just to make sure the farms are operating so that the wild deer don't get CWD, question mark. That's more of a question than it is a statement. So okay. um, I'm just really, you know, help me understand that one, Mr. Chair, I guess. Maybe it's the well, board needs to come up here or somebody, but yeah. I think that, uh, uh, I don't know, is anyone here from the, the board? Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. 
perhaps if, uh, Doctor, if you would uh, step forward and, and uh, talk about that budget a little bit, those costs and what have you. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Beth Thompson. I'm the state veterinarian and executive director of the Board of Animal Health. And if I can restate the question just so I understand, it's to how much money the board spends during a fiscal... Oh. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess my question, deeper question, is why should the general fund pay for all the work the board is doing? Um, and then the question mark is, you know, to make sure that the farms are operating so that the wild deer don't get CWD. And, and why that question exists out there is because when you look at the board spent, I think it was 600000 I can find that out. And, um, and just on the inspections just last year, and I know only received $30,000 um, in revenue from the farms that we're talking about. So I'm just trying to get an understanding of the bigger picture on, on where we're going with this, especially when we're looking at our budget being so tight. Did Dr. I clarify Thompson. that, Mr. Chair? Is that? Okay. Dr. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Chair, um, Senator, members of the committee, uh, generally our, our funding for the Board of Animal Health does come from the general fund. The, the CERVID program itself has never been a separate line item. And so the monies that we do get for the Board of Animal Health do come uh, simply from those fees that are already in statute. Send, Senator, uh, I have not, to, to that point, to that point. Okay, Senator Isaacson. If I can just add on to Senator Hoffman, I think the real question is, is that um, we're basically, he's questioning why we're using money from the general fund to then subsidize that group to hold on to what they're doing so they don't get rest of the deer. Why wouldn't that be fee-based? I, I, th I think also, Senator Isaacson, I would make the comment that I believe that there are a number of inspections in the department that actually come out, not in Board of Animal Health, but in mm -hmm. agriculture that come out of the general fund mm -hmm. uh, to begin with. And I don't know if uh, Mr. Mueller, or, uh, if you would like to offer anything. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman and <clears throat> members, uh, the chairman is correct that both at the board, the more at the Board of Animal Health, the general fund does subsidize most of their inspection programs. They do take some fees in for the farm survey day and the poultry, I believe, a little bit. But And then over at <clears throat> Department of Ag, like dairy inspection and uh, some of those other programs that do collect fees are also subsidized by the general fund. So it isn't, I don't think there's any one inspection program that is solely funded by right. fees. One little question. Senator Mr. Chair, do we have a sense of scalability there? Do we have a breakdown of that somewhere that could explain what the fees are compared to how much they're taking out? I'd be interested in seeing that by, by industry we inspect, if that's possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Lang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I didn't know if you wanted to finish up with the testifiers prior, I'm more of a general oh, statement. Okay, very good. Uh, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, just on the finance side of things, uh, I anticipate this coming to the, the Ag Finance Committee at some right. point, too. So a lot of those are questions we're going to certainly work on as, as the bill would move, I would think. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thompson. Uh, I, we have uh, some more of our survey day farmers here, and so please identify yourself for the record, and we'll try and get the, the, the you folks uh, taken care of here. Uh, is this on? Yes, it, it is. is. Okay. All right. I wasn't sure. I've seen everybody <laughs> pushing buttons. So uh, my name is Rich Meach. First, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to us today, Chairman. Uh, my name is Rich Meach. She's my wife, Sue. Uh, she can speak for herself, and you'll, you'll know that in a little bit. But uh, uh, we, we're serving producers up in uh, Park Rapids, Walker area, uh, north, north central Minnesota, uh, raised about 80 white-tailed deer, uh, came into the industry uh, about 10 years ago um, as Hey, we never knew this industry existed. Come from a dairy farm background, grew up as a kid on the farm. But uh, my th what I want to talk about today is uh, um, the overreach, I want to call it the overreach, of, of we are the most widely, most regulated industry in the livestock industry in Minnesota. We already are. So my thing is this, is when is enough enough? You know, we, we talk about 
uh, regulation. We need we need redundant gates. We need we need uh, you know there's legislation coming up this week. We got to be at hearings. Uh, double fences. You know when are they going to make us put a tarp over top of our farm so the birds don't come in? When is this? When is enough enough? Okay. Um, there's there's on sub uh, subsection seven here, uh, line two point seven. They talk about an enforcement officer. Um, this is an amendment to the first bill. The first bill mentioned the, the DNR. This one here, they took out the DNR and made us look up what an enforcement officer was or is. And an enforcement officer is a DNR department. It's, it's, it is. Yeah, Am I it correct? Is. Certainly it is. Certainly it is. It, yeah, Senator, you're yeah. present. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and we talked about that and changed that to a local CO, conservation officer. And yes, they are DNR employees. Are. But it won't be somebody coming out from, from St. Paul, for instance. It'll be somebody that knows the herd, knows you, works in the area, uh, knows the farm. And uh, we thought that was a better contact okay. than, than somebody coming from someplace else. So we just thought that was a better way of approaching it. Thank you, Senator. Thank Mr. Meads. They you. are DNR. They are DNR. Yeah. Okay, here's my, here's my situation. The DNR, in 10 years, the DNR has never been to our farm. They have never come to our farm, looked at our farm. They have no, they don't know what's going on in our farm because it's under the Board of Animal Health. Okay, so there's, there, we have no violations. So there seems to be a bias against the deer farmers from the Department of DNR. Just short. There, there seems to be a bias. Okay. Um, I have proof that there's a bias, and I'm going to share it with you here today. Okay, last night we were in Brainerd, Minnesota, talking about the CWD informational meeting up there. I hesitate to do this only because of the ramifications that could come from this, but after the meeting, I'm talking to Dr. Luke Hornicelli. His exact words were, last night, told us if deer farmers were gone, and there's talk of legislation to buy out deer farmers. We've even had this conversation with Mr. Engelbritson about it, okay? Um, deer farmers were gone. There would be one piece of the puzzle would be fixed. The risk would be gone. That's one piece of the puzzle. That's bias. That, as, as, a, as, a, as a person that lives in Minnesota, who the new rule in Minnesota is one Minnesota, that's as far from one Minnesota as we can get. That's my opinion. Doesn't have to be taken, but that's my opinion. Um, I don't know how much more we can take. Enough is enough. Do we, do we just shut our farms down? Is it regulate us out of business? Is that what they do? Is that where we're headed? Just regulate us out? I'm done. Thank you. Okay. And, and, and Ms. Meach, please identify yourself again for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Sue Meach. Um, we're deer farmers. We love what we do. We hand, we take such good care of animals. The DNR, after we were there last night, and we've known, because we have DNR in our area, they don't like us. They'll tell you they don't like us. They tell deer hunters they don't like us, because they think we're the problem. Well, the only reason we're the problem is because we test our deer that die on our farm. They're tested 100%. We go out in our pen, our doe that I've had for eight years, we cut her head off and send it in. And only reason we cut her head off is because we want to make sure when it gets to the lab that they get a good test and don't call us back and say, you didn't do it right, you didn't do this right. You, so then if we don't do it right, we are knocked down on our, on our CW level our status level. So these are things that we endure every day, but we love what we do, and I don't feel like we need to be pressured into all of these regulations. This is our free country. This is our livelihood. This is something that we're passing down to our grandchildren. Our children love it. I mean, I can show you pictures. We have a two-year-old granddaughter. We have two white fawns born this summer. I was so ecstatic. I love them. I bottle fed them because in the pen, the does will kill them because they think they're a predator. So I took them back and forth. I spent hours with them fawns. They're doing great. But our granddaughter loves them. 
So I'm just, I invite any of you to please come to our farm and see what we do before you judge us. Anybody, any deer hunter, anybody, to understand what we do to make a living. Because I don't think you people have to go through what we do to make a living. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Beach. And um, then our next testifier, please identify yourself and proceed. Welcome. Hello, my name is Todd Miller. I am from Southeast <coughs> Minnesota. Uh, I just want to thank you, Mr. Chair Weber, and the committee for allowing us to speak today. I guess my concern was one in uh, Section 7, 3.6. It's back. To, <clears throat> excuse me. It's back to uh, if uh, more than two escapes in a 12-month period. My question is: There is what about Mother Nature? I mean, what what if? What if a tree falls on? I mean, yeah, we're going to fix it and everything, but if the deer, if they get out, I mean, what, what can we do? What can we do about Mother Nature? I mean, it's different if people are not locked, doing their gates, and I think with the redundant gating that's coming is, is a good idea. But what happens if Mother Nature happens? We can't control her. Mm -hmm. And then uh, yeah. if they do, Seize these animals, the commissioner, the commissioner of the natural resources. Are we going to be paid for those animals? Is there indemnity money for those animals? The federal indemnity money should take care of that. I'm assuming. Okay. Or, or if they get out and in two, if we have the two, <clears throat> excuse me, if they have the two escapes in in a, a, a year period, they're just going to shoot the deer and we're out our deer. I mean, there, there's got to be a law against mm -hmm. that can't just come shoot people's livestock because they got out of their pen. I mean, cow, I see cows on the road. I see pigs, chickens. You know, I'm not going to go other. But so that was my question, more or less Mother Nature, if, if, if that occurs. Okay. All right. Uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Um, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> I did talk with the commissioner of ag before coming, or actually uh, he might even be here today. But when you talk about federal in indemnification, there are dollars available, just like there are for anybody else in the ag industry. Uh, should that have to happen uh, as far as you know nature itself uh, trees down things like that happen uh, that's why we're trying to you know encourage or, or at least try and get more inspections not again it appears that I'm pointing the finger at them not doing their own inspecting of course they don't want their own deer to get out I mean they make a living doing this I, I understand that and, and I appreciate the testimony and you can see the passion here I mean they really really love what they do uh, I, I do have to make one correction. The testifier a minute ago said that I had a discussion with them, and, and we actually had a discussion, all three of us, uh, earlier about, about uh, the possibility of buyout. Uh, but that was it. I didn't, it didn't imply at all that it was because of them we're having the CWD issue. I can't answer for uh, Mr. Cornicelli. I can't answer for him. Uh, but I know there's been a... There's been a uh, I guess a bad feeling. There's been a bad feeling there for some time. Um, and he's the big game specialist from the DNR, so just so you know that. Uh, he has his own opinions. Uh, they might be a little stronger than what I would, you know, obviously the one I would do. I think there is a place where we can all get along here, and um, that's why this bill needs a lot of attention, because it's something, you know, it's, it's a first. But again, we're talking, about, we're talking about something different than cattle and livestock. Be we're talking about the wild whitetail uh, herd as well that could be affected by this. And, or they could infect farms as well. I mean, they could do that as well. But there's a mechanism in place to destroy the animal if that happens. So it goes both ways. And uh, Dr. Josephson. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I am, my name is Dr. Scott Josephson, and I am a veterinarian from southwestern Minnesota. I've practiced there for 34 years, graduate of the University of Minnesota, um, resident of Minnesota all my life. Um, and I also serve on the, uh, ta the Survey Day Task Force uh, Advisory Group for the Board of Animal Health. 
Uh, my other credential is that I spend about a month every fall traveling around the, the Midwest uh, do, providing laparoscopic artificial insemination services to uh, white-tailed deer clients, white-tailed deer farms uh, across the Midwest and, and down far, as far south as Alabama. So I get exposure to a tremendous number of operations and uh, deer farmers and deer farm situations in several different states. I'd like to make a, the first thing I'd like to say is that um, uh, a couple comments made earlier uh, by earlier testifiers regarding uh, the Board of Animal Health versus the DNR as far as having jurisdiction over the, the disease, uh, the CWD problem within our state. Um, uh, two, two great examples for you to consider when you are deciding who should have jurisdiction over this problem are the avian influenza problem, uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Uh, uh, wild birds were a part of the issue with uh, our avian influenza problem. And the Board of Animal Health, uh, APHIS, and USDA handled that problem quite well by themselves. The DNR was not involved with that. So that's a, that's a great example. And it's also an example of an animal, it's a farm animal now, uh, that was once considered a wild animal. Uh, the, the wild turkey has now become a domestic turkey as far as the farm animals are concerned in the state of Minnesota. Minnesota is the number one turkey producer in the United States, and the Board of Animal Health oversees that problem. And the example that provides for us is that we have an animal that has the same species in the wild uh, that is now also a farm animal, but those animals exist for an entirely different purpose. The farm-raised turkey is produced for food, and the wild turkey is for our enjoyment as a wild animal in the wild under the jurisdiction of the DNR. Uh, the DNR does not have jurisdiction over the um, farm-raised turkeys. So that's a great example for the committee as you consider the situation of who should have jurisdiction over this situation with CWD. Second example is tuberculosis in cattle. Tuberculosis is a, also a pathogen that will infect white-tailed deer, and in fact, white-tailed deer could be a vector of that disease. Uh, when we had our outbreak in the state of Minnesota uh, recently in the last uh, 15 years, the DNR, or the DNR was not involved with that. The Board of Animal Health, APHIS, and USDA handled that very well and re reestablished our status uh, as a TB-free state by handling that disease. So there are two examples where the Board of Animal Health has handled quite, quite well and quite efficiently two diseases that affect the wild population and are also a problem for our farmed animals. Uh, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, to the veterinary, um, what, uh, it's, and, and maybe you recall, maybe you don't, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out why the uh, conclusion is that, that CWD somehow has originated in the farm animals and not in the wild, and I'm trying to square this, and maybe you can help square this in my mind. About 15 years ago, more or less, uh, I seem to recall right about at the turn of the century, uh, there was quite a uh, outbreak, and uh, Senator Tomasoni maybe remembers it. I know you were here then, uh, in the wild deer population. And uh, uh, what did we do to get rid of chronic wasting then, or do we know we, we got rid of it all, and uh, this is somehow a new new batch, uh, or is it still remnants of something that may never go away? Dr. Josephson. Yes, Chairman and Senator. Um, I, the, the CWD problem still exists and is, and is actually expanding uh, within the United States, although there are certain areas where CWD has, has become less of an issue, uh, where it was once a more significant issue. Uh, I don't know that anyone knows the reason for that, and maybe the, maybe the researchers from the university can help answer that question, but we're still dealing with the same prion and the same, uh, the same CWD disease as, the, as was, and we know, don't know how long that's been here. That, we have technology to, to detect that disease now, which we didn't have years ago, so this disease may have been around for years and years and years, and we just now have the technology and the ability to track it and follow it. But you bring, a, you bring a good point, and that's more to what I, what I intended to speak to um, um, today, and that is I think that we need to expand uh, how we are addressing uh, our, our understanding and our research efforts towards this disease. This disease has an environmental component, which may be, may be more significant than we really understand right now. Um, uh, the, the, 
we do know that carcasses, taxidermy waste, and, and certainly most likely gut piles um, and, and roadkill deer may actually provide an environmental um, hazard uh, for the soil contamination that they may provide. The Pennsylvania Game Commission states that very clearly in some of their, in some of their data. They say the contaminated carcasses or high-risk carcass parts may also spread the disease indirectly through environmental contamination. There's also been research done on scavengers and predators that the prion will survive, will survive passage through their intestinal tract, and so they'll pass the prion in their feces, so they may be part of this whole disease spread as well when we have scavengers of, of wild deer that, can, that are infected with CWD. The other, the other issue is uh, that uh, there are soil types that impact the survivability of CWD. Uh, the University of Alberta in Edmonton in Canada had a group of prion researchers that established that uh, a certain soil type actually uh, renders the prion non-infectious. And uh, certain soil types allow that prion to continue to exist for longer periods of time in the environment. So I think that we need to consider more, more the scope of this disease transmission than maybe what we are. And my final point is that I think that, and this point was brought up uh, earlier, I think, and discussed somewhat, that I think as a group, as a state, as, a, as state agencies, as the Board of Animal Health, as the DNR, I think that we need to take a different focus on how we approach this disease. We need to look at this as if the, the farm deer population is at risk just like the wild deer population is, and we need to look at the farm deer population as victims of this disease just as we look at the wild deer population and, and use our efforts in, uh, to help both those industries. And I think research efforts can be done and I think that this disease can be handled quite well by the researchers at the University of Minnesota and the Board of Animal Health. Um, you know, at this point, we have a couple of other bills that we do need to make sure we get out of committee today. Uh, but I do, I don't want to cut people off. I know that there are people from the elk uh, producers here too. Um, if there is any, uh, Mr. Quillis, briefly, can you, uh, you. and then, uh, and then uh, Mr. Bennett? Uh, if you could finish up, and then I, we have a couple of questions, and we'll quickly, we've got a queue here of uh, four or five senators, so. Mr. Chairman, um, my name is Tony Quillis. I'm a contract lobbyist here at the uh, state capitol, and uh, I have had the pleasure and honor of representing the Minnesota Elk Breeders Association for the last 20 years here. I want to thank Senator Ingebrigtsen, Senator Geigen. I think you've offered, uh, authored a bill also for your leadership on this issue. This is a very important issue, obviously, to the industry um, that I represent. Um, there are 80 facilities, eight, uh, roughly 80 elk uh, facilities that are members of ours. We have um, facilities in 75 of 87 counties. We have herds as small as 20. We have herds as uh, large as two to 300, and our average herd is about 42. And the reason I make that point is, is as we were talking about fees and caps on them, um, right now it's at 100. And if you if you use our average for uh, 42, it'd go from 100 to 420. But if you had 200 animals, it'd go from $100 to $2,000. So that's a, a pretty substantial jump there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to point that out. But I think um, we look forward to being uh, at the table as this discussion, discussion goes forward. I think you've heard the passion among everybody today. We look forward to be providing background and information and it moves forward. Senator Ingebrigtsen has been very helpful in reaching out to us and the stakeholders that are all involved in it, whether it's the deer hunters, um, the deer farmers, the Elk Breeders Association, the University of Minnesota, the DNR, the Board of Animal Health, have all have the same goal and it's either to try and keep it out of the state, which unfortunately it looks like with our surrounding borders we're not gonna be able to do, but at least slow its impact on it. And I have a number of concerns on the bill that I, um, I'm gonna walk through, but I know that you're short on time and you've got other things to go through and there's other stops on this bill, Mr. Chairman, so I appreciate the time today. And I'd like to turn over to Mr. Bennett. Thank you. Mr. Bennett. Mr. Chairman, Corey Bennett with the Minnesota Deer Owners Association. I will as be brief as well so that you can move on to your, to your other bills. I just wanted to uh, just comment on behalf of the Minnesota Deer Hunters. I, again, I can't thank uh, Chair Inga Brinson enough for, for bringing us all together. We have had very good discussions between the three groups, and I, and I appreciate all those comments that have been made. And we hope to continue those discussions as we move forward into this legislative session. I know they'll continue. I know that the, the bill will probably change and um, in and, and morph as we go through this process. I did want to say that there are portions of this bill the Minnesota Deer Hunters do support, uh, but you will see from your press release that uh, 
uh, has been referenced before that the deer hunters have put out. Um, this press release came out after our corporate board meeting a few weeks ago, and, and we felt uh, and had a lively discussion and came out with a very, what we thought is a very strong stance with regards to this very serious situation. Uh, as I mentioned, we are in support of some options or some things in this bill, um, but there are some other things that were left out um, according to what where our position is uh, that we would like to um, have included in some point, or at least have more discussion at some point. We know we'll have those discussions. And uh, so we will, uh, we will look forward to those and we will work with everybody involved, including yourself, Mr. Chair, as this moves forward. Thank you. Thank you. And also, I do want to, the Brooks Johnson was, had indicated uh, a desire to speak. Is, is Mr. Johnson here? Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure. He was with the uh, president of the Minnesota Bull Hunters, and I, if he was here, I didn't wish to uh, shortchange him his opportunity. Uh, I think at, at this point, I know that uh, there are various senators. Senator Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I, I'm going to touch on a few things as I've been digging through this bill, um, kind of going line by line. I think some of it's been touched on already, but I'm probably going to more or less give Mr. Quillis's testimony here for him, I'm assuming, um, as I've been paging through it here. And this is one of those things, I think, just overall looking at all of us sitting in here talking at, the, at length like we have about uh, not only the care we have for the animals that we're talking about because of tradition or what other items, uh, I think we're, we're, we're all concerned about CWD. I don't think that's a doubt any hand. The, the problem I have with that is I, I think there's some portions of this bill that are rather heavy handed. Um, as, I, as I page through here, I look at 1.28. Uh, an animal that is not identified as required in the subdivision may be destroyed by the Commissioner of Natural Resources. I'm, I, I mean, we thought about a warning possibly, you know, tag a deer if it was a couple days old, maybe we should be doing that. Um, if you page on, we go to, again, line point 2.13 popped up to $100. I think it's been mentioned a couple different times. I think we need to take a peek at that and make sure we have the right dollar value. On the next page, 3.6, that whole paragraph that's underlined, um, animals may, may be seized. You know, I, I, I wrote down extenuating circumstances. You know, that's the thing I'm thinking about. Uh, two times in 12 months. If we thought about a warning on that, if we've thought, thought about some sort of training, if there's some reasons that the animals are getting out of the pen. Uh, 3.26, depopulate the premise of this herd of a, you know, so are they compensated? If so, how are they compensated? I think that was brought up. I, I, the whole time I'm thinking, how are we doing that? Uh, 3.29 all the way over to 4.6, that whole paragraph. Um, five years that and if that's what needs be to keep the prions out of the ground, out of the certain types of ground that I, I think we we're all talking about, if it needs to be five years, we need to start talking about property value decrease. We need to start talking about can they sell that property. And then the other thing that came up to me was where have they found the wild deer dead on those farms? Is that a five-year indemnity that we have to start talking about? Uh, there's, a, there's a large population of wild deer in Minnesota that have been found. Every spot that they're found... Why is that ground any different than a, than a farm? Um, there's a couple of things as we've been talking about this over the last couple of years that come to mind as well. Uh, last year, I asked the question of the department. Uh, the first positive case of CWD was in 1967. In 1967, uh, I assumed the only reason that was the first positive case is because we developed a test that could test for it. That was the first time. Um, they, you know, the question that I posed at that point in time was, is this a, a disease that's been around for a millennium that we just didn't know about, now we can test for it so we can start adjusting for it? And really didn't get a solid answer, I think. Uh, Mr. Corner sort of gave the answer that he, he, we didn't really know, we didn't know enough about the disease. Uh, this year, I asked the same question to the same man and the question, and the question was answered in a way this year, it's a, it's a new disease, it's a different disease. So something between last year and this year has changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why you see this committee making much more of a, a concerted effort on what we're doing here. But the other thing that bothers me is the, the conclusion that, that somehow the, the farm deer are at, at the cause of this. You know, I think we heard an example in the last hearing we, in a different committee where the example was the farm was... CWD free for five years. There was no inputs or, or no, no additional deer transferred into that facility other than live births. And then they became CWD positive. So I think we're, we have, we have a, 
a substantial effort on a bill here, and I, and I appreciate the effort, I truly do. I think we need to, as a state, make an effort to, <coughs> to work on this. I think we need to work on the bill before we get any further. Yeah. But that's all I have to say, Mr. Um, so there are senators here on the policy committee that are also on the finance committee, and I know you're on the list. If you, uh, I would like you to rethink if you could share, save those comments or questions for the finance committee. We can deal with them there uh, so we can get a couple of these bills done that we need to get moved forward today. Uh, Senator Johnson, is that possible? Okay. Uh, Senator Eakin? As, and uh, Senator Goggin? And Senator Isaacson, you're not on finance, so please. And uh, my original question is still went unanswered, and I, I think that there is a, an assumption of maybe some, um, an assumption. I think that I'm not comfortable understanding what the scope is as it relates to the, to the, um, these locations that are being managed, and I think I'm concerned about that, and I want to understand what that relationship is to know in the sense if it goes too far or not far enough. Yeah. You know, uh, what I've read about the disease is pretty bad, and I'm concerned that if we're not taking care of it, we're in trouble. So I'd like to know more about that sure. at some point. Understood. Thank you, Senator Isaacson. And I will just comment before we have the vote. Uh, you know, I have heard this uh, d the discussion in both of the Environment and Natural Resource Committees I sit on, uh, as well as in my office, and as well as here. And, and I, I do wish to say that it is my opinion that the Farm Survey Day are as much at risk from the wild uh, as anything else uh, that is out there as we look at the uh, different situations out, uh, that occur. And quite frankly, I think if we are ever to find a genetic response to an answer to the problem, uh, that quite frankly, we need our farms in order for that uh, to be accomplished. Uh, with that uh, having been said, Senator Lane renews the motion that Senate file uh, 1995 as amended uh, be recommended to pass and re-refer to the Environment Natural, Re oh, excuse me, to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, with the understanding, obviously, and Senator Ingebrigtsen, I know, is aware of the number of issues that need to be dealt with, whether we're talking about fees, fencing, uh, other issues uh, as relates to uh, matters that uh, Judiciary will be taking up. But um, with that, all those in favor of that uh, motion and re-referral signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion is hereby carried. The bill is approved and re-referred to judiciary. Mr. Chair and members, thank you very much for the robust and consideration for the testimony here tonight. Thank you. Uh, we will now turn to Senate File 1698. Um, and um, Senator Westrom moves Senate File 1698 uh, be uh, recommended to pass and re-refer to the Ag World Development and Housing Finance Committee. Um, this... Uh, and at this point in time, uh, we will uh, turn to Senator Westrom and uh, welcome, Senator, and uh, as to your bill. Well, Mr. Uh, Chair, uh, if it gives you any uh, better feeling or solace, um, you know, sometimes uh, the Ag Committee and their committees that we deal with are kind of like milking a cow. Uh, I grew up milking cows, and uh, Mr. Chair, there's only so fast you can make a cow produce and, and drop its milk. And so uh, sometimes it's only so much, so fast we can get a committee. So I appreciate uh, the great discussion we just had. But uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll move the bill and uh, uh, briefly... I'll turn it over to my testifiers, but uh, uh, to set the stage in short, uh, the dairy industry is a, in significant uh, financial stress right now, uh, low milk prices for a, uh, an extended period of time, and uh, we are losing a dairy farm a day on the average in the last 12 months. Uh, we've lost uh, over three 300 dairy farms, uh, we're now down around 2,700, perhaps lower yet. And um, so what this bill is a, an attempt to do, uh, working with the dairy producers and uh, uh, other interested parties, is to uh, bring forth a discussion, uh, first of all, but uh, is there some uh, reasonable ways that the state uh, to try to uh, help preserve the far family farms and the dairy farms that are out there in our state and contribute a significant portion to our state's 
economy and the ag sector uh, across our rural counties. Uh, what can we do to be a uh, meaningful help to promote uh, dairy products and preserve and uh, uh, be, a, uh, be of assistance to, to the dairy industry? And so what this does, it would put forth uh, a uh, temporary plan of moving uh, to help pay for the uh, cost of insurance for the farmers that are participating and choose to participate in the milk margin program. It's a federal program, and I'll let my testifiers talk about it further. But that is a, a cost to help, or a program to help give dairy farmers uh, a, a bit of a floor or a type of crop insurance, if you will, uh, for their dairy farm, which uh, naturally they don't uh, don't participate in crop insurance for their milk production, but it'd be a, it's a similar type program. But it does cost a premium that they have to pay. So when margins are down, they uh, they are potentially eligible to collect. But when prices are good, they don't collect, but they still have to pay a premium. With that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to my testifiers. But that's kind of a, a backdrop and a uh, setting the setting the stage for what the bill is attempting to do. Thank you, Senator. And uh, Mr. Jostrom, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Lucas Schostrom, Executive Director at Minnesota Milk Producers Association. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, and thank you, Senator Westrom, uh, for being alongside us here. I'll go briefly here. Thanks for the time today. Uh, we do have one person. It's not me. It's not Senator Westrom. We've all milked cows. But we do have one person skipping milking cows today, so I do appreciate the extra time. Um, I'll go through my graphs quickly. I believe you all have them in front of you. Is that correct? Uh, okay. And um, uh, no surprise here. I think you, you've heard that from 12,000 and about 1990, we're at about 2,700, as um, Senator Westrom referenced. We have uh, cheese stocks hanging over the market. And uh, that's, that's good news, because this is our, our biggest problem. Last year, we had two problems. We had cheese stocks, and we had solid stocks in Europe. All the solid stocks have been eaten up in Europe, and that is a really, really good uh, sign of things. And so if I had longer and next week at Dairy Day at the Capitol, hopefully I can tell you uh, more about the story of, of why I think, although we're at the bottom here, we've got a lot of optimism, and this is something to invest in for both the state of Minnesota and, of course, the individual dairy farms and the, the economies. Um, but this is the graph I want to center on. Uh, Minnesota Dairy Farms Net Income, this comes from Farm Business Management, and I should say 2018 is only an estimate at this point. Uh, we don't have those final numbers back in, so that's uh, using some other numbers. But uh, I want to just remind everyone that these are the best numbers people give over to their bankers in hopes to get a loan. Uh, these are not uh, massage numbers to make us uh, uh, look good. These are the best possible numbers we can get. And uh, I don't know if you want family living at, at $10,000, $20,000, or, or $30,000 for a family of four at 200 cows, but that is not built into the system. So health insurance, uh, take home, uh, something like that. Uh, this is just um, a longer looking back of the the year on year loss, but here's the current rates as of January 1st. We've got 10, we hit 10.2 percent in January. The only good news out of this is February went down slightly, um, and as Senator Westrom said, we have 2,700 farms roughly in Minnesota. I will now turn it over to the other testifier, who again is here and not milking cows today, which is probably where she'd rather be. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you. Welcome to the committee, uh, Sadie Frerichs, and uh, please uh, identify yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Sadie Frerichs. I'm a dairy farmer from Melrose, Minnesota. I own Blue Diamond Dairy with my husband, and I, I love milking cows, but I'm also pleased to be here with you today. I am uh, going to provide a little more color to the need for these uh, bills in front of you today, and I want to start by... Um, telling you a little bit about my family and my farm. I'll keep this brief because I know we only have a couple of minutes, but I am a first generation dairy farmer by practice. I grew up on a dairy farm, but my husband, and, and my husband did as well, but we uh, did not have a farm to go home to per se, so we started our own dairy farm. That means that we don't have generations of equity to fall back on when we have a situation like the one in front of us. Knowing, um, you know, growing up in the dairy industry, we knew that um, there are good years and bad years in dairy farming. We knew that when we got started, and we built our business plan accordingly. In 2014, when prices were high, we started setting funds aside in what we call our O Sugar Fund. And um, 
I want you to know that um, all of the things that we did to make our business the strongest it could be, including that set aside fund and all of the uh, um, other expenses that we've trimmed this year, were not enough. We, uh, we burned through our sugar fund by the middle of 2018. We cut our family living expenses by $15,000, and that was um, starting coming down from a, a pretty lean number already. We've had a lot of conversations in this past year about what are we going to do if something doesn't change. We know that, that farms, I can do the next slide. This is our farm, and uh, if you'd like to learn more about it, um, you can visit our website. But we started having conversations about what we're going to do if this doesn't change. And one of those was seeking off-farm income. The good news is that something changed. Our federal legislators passed the Farm Bill, amazingly, and have an incredible dairy title in there that will provide us some much-needed assistance. Senator Westrom's bill will make that assistance even more affordable in a time when we need all of the help that we can get. I'd like to remind you that uh, a farm like mine, we milk 90 cows on our, our farm, spends about a half a million dollars a year in our local economy in, on a, in a typical year. So every one of the farms that we're losing a day is a half a million dollars less economic stimulation for the state and for that local community. I encourage you to take a, a closer look at these bills and do what you can in your committee to provide assistance for the dairy farmers of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rarix. Thank you, sir. Um, nice job. Any uh, questions on the part of the committee? And I assume at the end of the bill, Senator, uh, um, Westrom, you have left the appropriation blank as you to go through and try to estimate exactly where those numbers would come in. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, Mr. Chair, and we're, we're still needing to firm up those numbers uh, and, uh, of course, find, find where that money would come from uh, as, as time moves on here. But we, are, we, we do not have a definitive number at this point in time. Is there anyone else that wishes to testify on this bill? If uh, not, uh, Senator Westrom, any final comments? Mr. Chair, uh, I think we've said it all. I think Sadie uh, did a fantastic job of setting the table, if you will, and uh, making the case for why this would be a big help, a shot in the arm to uh, help our dairy farmers uh, have the hope and uh, continue till uh, markets correct themselves and uh, ultimately uh, they and other farmers like them uh, in the dairy industry uh, can be, be back to making a profit and filling up that O sugar fund again. So uh, uh, thank you uh, to Sadie for uh, making the trip down here and the sacrifice. And um, uh, I, I well know of, of how hard it is to get away from milking cows uh, growing up on a dairy farm. And so uh, uh, I, don't, I wanna, uh, want you to understand the commitment that goes along with that. So. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. I'd appreciate the support to move this along as we can con continue to try to find uh, best solutions we can to help uh, be a part of the solution. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Thomasoni, you had an well, item. Mr. Chairman, I went to her website. And did you mention that you have a dog, 11 cats, 26 free-range chicken, chickens, and a variety of wildlife on the farm? I don't think I, don't think I heard that. <laughs> they told me to keep my comments uh, concise because of the time limit. So We can go through the names. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. With that, uh, Senator, Senator Westrom renews his motion that Senate File 1698 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Ag Rural Development and Housing Finance Committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion's carried. The bill is hereby passed and re-referred. Again, thank you, testifiers, for thank you. coming thank you. in. Thank you. Yep. And I would just mention that the next bill uh, will be the last bill that we hear today. And so Senate Files uh, 1887, 1669, 1611, and 1644 will be carried ahead to Thursday. Uh, with that, uh, we turn to... Um, 
Senate File 1699, Senator Goggin moves it to be uh, recommended to pass and we refer it to the Ag Rural Development Housing Finance Committee. Senator Goggin, welcome to your bill. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, committee members. I had a great speech lined up for this, but uh, I'll keep it short. <laughs> um, what Senate File 1699 does is it establishes green payments uh, for our Minnesota dairy farmers uh, that meet certain uh, minimum conservation standards that are determined by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, this is a one-time conservation stabilization payment uh, to help our, our struggling dairy farmers financially, uh, but most importantly, rewarding them and incentivizing them for uh, the environmental stewardship that they do on their farms. And uh, last weekend, I, I do want to, before I go on any further, I do want to thank uh, Commissioner Peterson uh, for coming down to Winona County and uh, uh, with me and, and others to uh, uh, survey the damage from the excess of snow we got in February uh, in the barns at, uh, and animals that were lost at the dairy farms. Uh, and uh, again, it's a, a, a sad state that our dairy farmers are in. And um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Mr. Socham. Yep. Okay, uh, thank you. Senator Weber, uh, members, uh, same story. Uh, I guess just in both of these bills, the previous bill that you, that you laid over in this one, um, I, I just want to be clear, dairy farmers uh, would never expect something for nothing. And, and uh, I think in both cases, we can provide benefits to the state of Minnesota that outweigh the cost here. And so, so essentially in this bill that Senator Goggin has put forth, um, we would recognize conservation practices that dairy farmers can and, and in some cases already do do um, to uh, help help the state, help our waters, help our land. And I think um, what we have here in a very similar fashion to the previous bill is just um, help, but also in exchange for something good that dairy farmers can do. Very good. And uh, again, as you note, uh, the uh, blank, there are blank spots on the appropriation fee uh, lines so we get to on the Finance Committee. Any questions on the part of the committee members? Uh, if uh, not, uh, Senator Goggin, any final words? Uh, well, thank you for hearing the bill, and uh, you know this is this is going to be a huge help for our, our dairy farmers in the state, and uh, just help them get through the gap that they're dealing with right now. So. Thank you. Thank you. And I wish to assure the testifiers, even though we have had to had sort of a short time for testimony, we certainly recognize the seriousness of the situation. And with that, Senator Goggin renews his motion that Senate File 1699 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Ag Rural Development Housing Finance Committee. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motions carry. The bill is hereby passed and be referred. Just a note to uh, committee members, in case you haven't caught it, there will be a meeting tomorrow noon with the Department of Ag uh, concerning the uh, roof collapses that we've had on agricultural buildings across Minnesota. And um, so that is in room 2308. Well, if you can make it, we'll look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. With that, the meeting is hereby adjourned.